Nigel has 21 years experience as a consultant and client side, uh, which is gained from working with legal, uh, leading organisations in the UK and the MENA region. Nigel is an RIBA architect with a certificate of association architectural professional practice from Plymouth University. More recently, he gained a certification in commercial real estate analysis and investment via a short course at MIT. He's progressed from lead architect and design manager through to regional and development director roles, uh, coordinating and managing teams of developers, consultants, contractors and ultra high net worth individuals in multi stakeholder environments. His experience is both regional and international and covers a wide range of uh, typologies and scales from very small to very large scale projects. Um, Nigel is currently working as the design director for Southern in KSA. Yes. Excellent. Right. Thank you so yeah. much, Nigel. Thank you. Yeah, OK, great. I was trying to think of a title for this talk and because um, there's so many different sort of subjects and themes that I want to try and cover in a short space of time. Um, and I was thinking, life of an architect? Ah, oh, no, it's a little bit. So it sounds like a uh, cycle like already passed away, so I thought I'd better not do that. Life, life on the dark side. When you're working on the client side, working for a developer as an architect, um, in the industry it's known as are you working on working on the dark side? On the dark side. It's in the title. Um, I couldn't put it anywhere. I'm going to structure the talk around the timeline for 1994 to 2021, present day. 1994 being the date where I was effectively in your situation doing my degree at Plymouth, uh, Plymouth School of Architecture. Um, and I'm going to just use that timeline to structure, as I said, a whole load of sort of things. Um, but those being, there'll be some hints and tips along the way, just recommendations, words of wisdom, whatever you want to call it, take them, take them or leave them. Um, there'll be some themes of architecture and urban design that have just been throughout that entire period that just seem to be recurring things that come up from projects whether on consultant side or client side and um, um, and then I'll talk a little bit about the actual client side role specifically towards the end um, and that'll be um, yeah, 2020, uh, 2016 to 2021. So just quickly, uh, 1994 to 1997 I did my Bachelor of Arts degree at uh, Plymouth University um, uh, southwest of England. Uh, when I chose that university, I just chose the furthest place away from home on the map because I just wanted to get away. Not nothing against my parents. I just wanted to do, uh, just have a different, a different feel for uh, for the UK. Um, completed my degree, 1997 to 1999. Um, I went travelling, and look, I just really recommend this, uh, just just as a as a as a, as a as a food for thought straight off the bat. Um, it's the perfect time when you're studying in between degree and diploma potentially to go traveling. Me and a couple of friends took a backpack on our back and went traveling for a year and a half all around the world. We went, went to a whole countries here. It was a bit extreme. My parents thought I was never coming back, but as architects, the, 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 this is so impactful in your lives. Traveling generally, beyond just reading books and, and looking at stuff on the internet, this will this will be the sort of inspiration for you for the rest of your life. And if you if you go straight into work into um, working practice, it's it's unlikely that you'll find a break to go and do something like that again until maybe you retire because life just gets a hold of you. So I just recommend just getting out there and you know interrailing around Europe, whatever it might be. Go and have a look at your heroes' projects. Go and look at you know Cabusier's projects, whatever. Just get out there and travel and see the world because it will fuel your career. For the rest of your career, it, it, it's it's really an inspirational thing to do. Um, sorry, that slide is messed up a little bit. Um, 1999 diploma and part time work. Again, just a small recommendation. When I was doing my diploma work, I was working a day a week in an office, not just for the practical experience, but it just starts to really, really push you in terms of your how you manage your time, how you manage stress, because you're just piling on more than just the status quo. Um, of, of work that's at university. You're trying to work, you're trying to party, you're trying to do all these things and it's it's good, it's good practice. I'll throw these up, um, some, of, some of the university work, you guys have got so much more technology available to you now than we had then. This was over 20 years ago and me and a couple of friends on the course were trying to sort of play around with microstation at the time and do 3D work. I just encourage you just absolutely get into the 3D work because 
Um, you know, our built environment and buildings are 3D objects. They're not 2D. They're not 2D planes. Um, the more that you can investigate your projects, this looks very simplistic now. Looking back over 20 years, when we consider the renders that you're able to get from from these days from the software you guys have access to, but I'll just say push yourself to to use that and, and, and still draw, continue to draw. One of these projects, in terms of architectural um, uh, themes and urban themes. This project was done by the home years. There's, there's things in this now that 20 odd years later I still look back on. And I think well, they're just playing out constantly on all the projects. The idea of public realm, courtyard spaces, and, and, and creating things that are of, of a human scale. I remember at university the lecturer coming in and saying, this project's got a really nice scale to it. And it's the same things just keep coming up time and time again on every project that I've um, been involved in. And um, the idea of of, of um, mixing the program and, and having this as a foyer project for, for people who were out of work and trying to get back into employment. So the idea of mixed program with office space, workshop space, a cafe, residential component, you know, the idea of layering a project so that it doesn't just become one static component. So I went to work immediately uh, 2001 to 2002 um, at an office in Exeter um, just for a year. Starting small, starting on small projects is don't expect to go straight into the big CEO role working on the huge big projects. You know, you've got to start, you've got to be, you've got to be humble, you've got to start small. I was working on some industrial sheds and small accommodation um, projects, 20, 30 apartments. Um, I don't know how many images from this, this is quite a way back. And I'm going to try to that. I use some 3D software, so, so suddenly you're being asked to, we're working on this project, and we're being asked to look at the conversion of this building and the atrium design. You do a couple of designs, next minute the stuff's being built and somebody's using the staircase. And, and it's a quite a shock when you first graduate that you're you're suddenly working on things and they're just being built, and you think <laughs> you have to kind of stop and take, take stop and take stock. Um, even with these small components in, in buildings because you've been used to playing with ideas at the university um, and and you know just yeah it's it, it's it's a shock when this first <laughs> when this first happens um, but it's a, good, it's a good shock and it makes you realize how um, uh, open you can be at university um, one extreme to the other from doing little concept models to suddenly I like, wasn't involved in the design of this project but having to suddenly go onto site and inspect 70 apartments in Bristol, snagging for the building contractor, um, checking you know whether architraves were scratched and kitchens were ruined and, and all of this stuff. So you're suddenly very quickly starting to experience both ends of the, uh, the spectrum. Um, Photoshop skills, I'm sure you'll use Photoshop skills and Photoshop, but what a great tool. This was again you know, looking back um, what 16, 17 years, but um, just the ability to be able to do just quick, quick sketches and colour them up and um, and all of that. Um, 2003, I got my chartered architect qualification. Um, great question, Dr. Why did I put this slide up? Um, yeah, sometimes, I'll come back to this in a bit, but sometimes you need to challenge the brief, and sometimes you don't succeed in challenging the brief. This is um, this is a very famous ship in Bristol. Um, they needed the, the development, they needed to create some real estate development at the rear to realize the long term um, upkeep of the ship. That was that, that much was known. Um, and the client was absolutely convinced that they wanted to recreate the footprint of these old buildings that used to be there a long, long time ago when the ship was made. We pushed back and kept pushing back because we wanted to do this fantastic contemporary development. And in the end, we lost. But what we did do was try to interpret some of the details of those old buildings to try and create something that had a little bit more grain to it. Um, and in the end, the client was right because it was the ship that was the star of the show here. It wasn't about the architectural buildings at the backdrop. It was all about the ship. And these buildings needed just to fade away into the background. And I will say push the, push the brief and challenge the brief, but sometimes you need to take that, that brief when it's that clear and just try to think outside the box and, and, and do the best that you possibly can with what seems like a very limited brief at the time. Um, so one of the quality of awards actually has ended up being the backdrop um, is just off Google Maps to speak back to the ship, which is this huge attraction visitor centre in Bristol, and which is great again is this kind of mixed use little community around it, the visitor centre and workshops and, and residential um, units. Um, 
the competitions. I, I, I remember this came while I was working in Bristol as as a as Sprite, and um, I just said, "Hey guys, does anyone want to work in this competition? There's a cool competition in Manchester." And no one wanted to do it. And I took four or five evenings that week. I was working long hours anyway, but I went home and just crushed out some models and put some presentation boards together. And you know what? It doesn't matter that it didn't win. It's the it's the it's pushing yourself, the creative process, just keep going through and refining as you go through your career, the creative process and 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 um, you know allowing allowing all of these things to sort of play out to, to a to an ultimate conclusion. Um, 2006, I left the UK came to Dubai. We all know what was happening in Dubai um, in 2006. Uh, the place was going crazy. Um, you know, they were proposing the tallest building in the world, which of course they achieved. We were suddenly being asked to um, go from you know doing these buildings behind the shipyard in Bristol to doing 50-story uh, towers on Shakeside Road, and suddenly the idea of trying to sketch this stuff out was a completely different scale for me. Um, but really, really exciting period. Um, we spent the best part of three years at Brewer Smith Brewer doing construction, um, sorry, taking taking projects from um, from the concept stage right the way through to the tender documentation stage. So a lot of hard work churning out projects um, that ultimately, unfortunately, a lot of them got cancelled because of the global financial crisis. But um, in terms of architectural themes um, and urban design themes, examples like this is competition for the Palm Jabal Ali. The same, the same sort of recurring themes would come up in terms of cascading of building elevations, um, trying to achieve a sense of human scale, creation of urban plazas. Palm Jabal Ali, they wanted to try and um, uh, overcome some of the uh, issues that they had on the Palm Jumeirah, which they still have, which is the connectivity across the road. So there was a proposal here for, uh, we looked at to create this brand new urban plaza, create a mixed use component with residential retail Commercial offices and try and create some, sorry, try and create some, um, some, some public uh, public space uh, and connect connect to the side of the roadway. Um, just a very quick one. Uh, that 2009 to 2011 was my first experience of the client side. I was headhunted for a role to go over to um, Doha and work on projects that were based in Libya. Um, you can probably guess how this ended. Uh, it wasn't very it wasn't very well, um, but. Uh, we spent one year in Doha um, working with consultants and as I say, my first experience of just suddenly having to um, review other architects' drawings, you know, red penning them, um, uh, just effectively acting as the, as the last sort of line of defence for the client before um, this thing would get built. And we're working on a huge master plan, I don't have um, hardly any slides on this, a um, huge master plan, five-star hotel, uh, five-star Hilton resort project um, in uh, Alban Zor, just to be as easy for Tripoli. We arrived on site, we did a year in Doha, arrived on site, um, and it looked like this. Um, a few weeks later, it looked like this. A few weeks later, it looked like this. And then, unfortunately, um, you know, the bombs, the bombs started going off and we were, we were running for cover. So it didn't end particularly well, but it was an amazing first experience and first taste for me of life on the client side. Um, and the scale of the project suddenly just, you know, just ballooning um, with, these, with these sort of master plans. Um, came back to Dubai after that, it felt like a pretty safe, safe cover um, yeah, compared to being in Libya. Um, and spent um, five years working back with the same company that I worked with in, in, in Bristol. Um, suddenly opened up the doors to a whole range of projects. Um, so many proposals during that five-year period. I was the design director for a number of years, followed by I was promoted to regional director. And for any of you who are thinking of having your own practice, Strike Plan at that time was a branch office of an overseas office, so like a satellite office. And it was an amazing experience of what it would be like to have your own your own company, your own practice, but supported by an overseas firm. Um, you've got the back of some resource there. And, and it's and it's it's hard work, you know. You've got to go out there and try and win projects. You've got to go out there. You've got to do some competition proposals. You've got to go knocking on the client's door. You've got to build your network. You suddenly have to really put yourself out there and and try and drum up work for the company. Um, so we were we were entering all possible competitions we could. We were speaking with all the clients, the developers in the region. Um, I was networking, and it's 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 tough. It's hard work, but it can be extremely rewarding when you land certain projects, I'll, I'll, I'll just show a couple in a moment. 
just back to challenging the brief. Always, always, always challenge the brief. It doesn't sometimes pay off, but here's a great example. This, this is a proposal Mosque Al Dhabi. The brief, the brief, this, this area here is an existing car park years ago, it was an existing car park, so you used to come park and go visit. The brief, the brief called for a new visitor centre here. And we just we, we saw that we said that doesn't make sense. People are going to come in, they're going to park the car, they're going to go into the mosque, they're going to come out, the weather's warm, they're going to get in the car and they're going to leave. So no, no one would visit, visit the visitor centre. So we challenged the brief and we said, surely there's a sequence that needs to happen here where you park the car and then you have this landscape plaza that acts as a staging ground for the mosque and we'll put the visitor centre below ground with this camera obscure and part of fully digitised experience of the mosque. And that sequence seems to work because when people walk across this, they well, actually need to photograph the mosque and then come back out and experience again the visitor centre of the plaza and then they go back to the car. Anyway, we presented it, they absolutely loved it. But they said no, because they said you haven't followed the brief. And they said, We understand the logic and it looks great, but you haven't followed the brief. And we said, Okay, so we lost the competition. Um, they went and built a visitor centre right here. And I just heard very recently that there's not many people going to that visitor centre. <laughs> it doesn't work very well. Um, so they're having to rethink the whole thing and figure out how to, yeah, anyway, I'll say more. So just Challenge, challenge the brief because sometimes the brief doesn't make sense. Um, and um, it's sort of things to do. We worked on uh, military training, military training practices um, uh, for sort of secret service special forces uh, in Abu Dhabi. Uh, we did um, modular school uh, buildings for um, for Abu Dhabi education, Abu Dhabi education council proposals for, for modular schools. We did um, uh, service uh, apartment buildings, we did student accommodation, and you know, I remember sketching this thing out, had it modelled, and then the next minute things been built, and it's like, oh, another one of those, oh my goodness, my goodness, it's where you just think the client had a crazy low budget, but they, they managed to build it. Um, tower proposal for um, uh, for a client, a prospective client, I should say, in, uh, in, uh, in Hong Kong. Um, Road hotels, we, we were appointed as the interior designer for the first six road, road hotels. I'm sure you've all, uh, all heard of road hotels, so we did the full interior design for all of those, um, which was a great commission to get. Um, it's been a really successful um, uh, brand for EMA. Um, we wrote all the brand standards for the interior design um, and there's some sort of, sort of tower uh, proposals. Um, right, this is starting to get us bang up to, bang up to date, really. How uh, long for time? Okay, right. I was asked if I wanted to go from another role client side. Um, and uh, this was the income properties in Abu Dhabi, and I, I jumped at the opportunity um, because we were working on Majors District. We we're coming up with Majors District, the project. Um, what we saw of Rio Island. We have this land piece. This is pretty much where I arrived at, at um, the in camp. 186,000 square metre land piece. And you know, you're, 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 you're given this, and you think, well, what do, what do we do? Where, where do we even start as a developer? Um, how, how, do you, how do you begin to create something which is going to be, um, yeah, which is, which is going to have be, be unique? Um, we, we wanted to create a hub in Abu Dhabi for the makers and the creators and the artists and the artisans and the startups and the entrepreneurs, this kind of new funky neighbourhood um, that is just lacking in the city. Uh, the kind of thing that you find in Shoreditch in London is how do we create this vibe? Um, so we um, we knew we wanted to also do a do a sort of sustainable a set of sort of do a sustainable master plan master plan development model. Um, Effectively, medium density, high density, mixed use projects are that, that, that are walkable, walkable projects um, are, are the model, is the way forward. It's a sustainable model. It's the antithesis of a CBD, a central business district, and an urban sprawl where people spend an hour or two hours in the car driving to the central business district, work, and then drive back 
you know, that takes some valuable land and uh, you know, it creates all sorts of problems and also huge detriment to the environment. So, so just as a straight off the bat, just as a as a development model, we wanted to do a mixed use uh, walkable community development. We wanted to deal with all these things about human scale and we wanted to get away from the typologies of parking um, uh, podiums and towers on parking. So first stage was to get a master plan drawn up. Uh, we had RNL design that's now Spantec and then Mega from LA um, draw up an initial master plan for us. We phased it. We were looking at early activation um, of uh, what is now Code Beach Abu Dhabi is on this side here. Um, and also we have this guy here um, which is a parking structure which is right in the middle of our plan um, which was to deal with overflow overflow parking from the neighbouring hotels and, and residential buildings and also uh, for visitors. Um, one of the first tasks I had was that we thought we thought we'd deal with that parking structure as a as a seed building for the project. And one of the first um, the first thing that I had to do at Inca was to prepare, prepare a competition brief that went out to sort of architects, uh, the likes of them, the RTV and the RP Ingalls group, or big as they know, um, and big won the competition um, and we started to work on what became the archery. Um, we had a precedent study for such a project. This is 1111 Lincoln Road in Miami by Hillside of Nomura. We wanted to create this hybrid hybrid structure. It's more than just a car park. It's a, it's a hybrid mixed use project. Um, this project ended up transform, more transforming the whole district in Miami. Um, they use it for supercar shows, uh, fashion shows, weddings, um, everything, everything you can imagine. This ended up being a huge, hugely valuable piece of real estate. Um, uh, Big did uh, lots of research for us, we looked at spatial typologies like you know, Google, WeWork. Um, Lots of research into environmental comfort sustainability because of the mixed use aspect of the building, auditorium research. We ended up with this model, a really cool proposal uh, that they came up with, which was this double helix. So you had this parking ramp and then a maker's ramp, and it was a kind of sandwiched double helix. You see on the bottom right there, this idea. Um, and it was because it was the first building on the site, and there'd be nothing else around it, it would be a very sort of inward looking building. To sort of protect the events, try to try to um, uh, you know while the rest of the development was being constructed, the section through the model. The idea that you could use this space for events, so the kind of the kind of Louvre facade that you can see there was like the parking helix, and then you've got the maker's helix where you can see the people uh, standing. View the project from the outside from around the district. Again, where the sort of green facade is the parking helix and the maker helix. Um, so it's a really interesting process of trying to create this seed project, which would which would act as a seed for the development and could attract people and attract footfall um, while the rest of the project is being constructed. The makers' pods. So the idea is that you can have sort of little exhibitions, um, and then yeah, this is just looking at these flexible, flexible space typologies within the within the structure. Um, modularity with the pods are based on the car park space module of how you can have these different different pods. Um, so it's a really cool, really cool project to work on them with. Um, MVRDV. Sorry, can you hear me? I'm keep forgetting. I'm dropping this. Um, so we had um, MVRDV work, work um, were awarded, I should say, um, this plot here, um, 24,000 square meter plot, like a, a, a micro community within the development. Um, mixed use, mixed use, the program was mixed use, residential, retail, F&B, food and beverage, um, and commercial office space. And we wanted to make the commercial office space small enough that it would appeal to the makers and the creators, the startups, the entrepreneurs. As I was saying, it wasn't about having a huge big floor plate that if you were an entrepreneur and you wanted to sell your own architectural practice, you could go in and find a 50 square meter space or whatever it might be. You wouldn't go in and say, I don't want a whole floor plate, I can't afford a floor plate. But you could go in and actually um, run something in this, uh, in this project. Uh, some, of the, some of the site analysis exercises that we did, this is a really cool um, thing to do um, where you take your um, your site and sort of overlay it on different 
it, it, it's funny if you know these areas and you've visited them, that's what I say about traveling, because you can always think in your mind about dealing with this site. This is this is kind of scale density wise what it looks like if I overlay that it, with this with this place that I know. Um, so this was this was useful for us to kind of get the scale. We wanted to create um, we wanted to create, um, you know, intimate streets. So, you know, studies of studies of um, what, what sort of scale of street do we want on this on, on, on this on this little district? Um, you know, do we want the big, you know, the round of Barcelona, 30 meter wide? Well, no. Um, you know, more like Melbourne, Harvard Lane. So, so lots of lots of lots of studies. I mean, I'm just scratching the surface with the site research here, of course, but just to give you a feel. Um, MBRB that work very, very similar to, uh, to the Art Eagles group in the sense that they always test um, the program and the GFA, the, glo the gross floor area or the built up area, if you include the parking. Um, they test it in all the different sort of possible ways of manage manageable on the site just to kind of explore and make sure there's no stone that's left unturned. They create physical models, 3D models, and they explore all of those to test. Even, even some that feel ridiculous and you can dismiss them straight away, they at least go through this process of testing and testing and retesting all of the different scenarios. We eventually landed on one that we thought looked really interesting, which was this one, which was effectively seven mini towers arranged around the central plaza. Again, because the rest of the master plan was going to take years to build out, we wanted to sort of have this this idea of real sort of placemaking where you could create this really beautiful plaza um, in the centre of these of these buildings. And when we saw this, I mean the first thing we thought was it looks like Minecraft, but we thought this actually looks really interesting. The idea that rather than standing in a 20 or 30 story tower and kind of pressing your nose against the glass and looking down and having no connection with your neighbourhood or with your community. Um, not being able to see anybody, you know, um, we thought, how cool would this be if you could walk out on the balcony and you could look left and right, you could wave to the neighbour, you could shout down to a guy in a coffee shop on the ground floor. And so this idea again of layering of program um, and, and layering the program not just in plan but in section um, was, was really appealing to us. Um, different ways of, of, of composing the facades. Again, these sections of sort of talking about it earlier, but this idea of um, you saw on the arm proposal C here again, this idea of cascading back so that when you're walking through the public realm, you're not just got this sheer face of a, of a building next to you, it feels more human scale because the building is starting to step back. Um, again, program distribution, so ground floor, retail, and food and beverage, first floor. We have the, the, the office, the maker space with these small residential units and the residential components stacked on top. And uh, look, you can see the way the drawings that these guys use to present their projects is just, it's so clear when you look at um, uh, these, these these architects, you know, it's just a craft that you learn over the years, but it, of all the people that I've worked with, when I work with these guys, you know, you really start to appreciate there's a few more drawings later you start to appreciate how crisp and clear a drawing can be um, uh, if you really distill it down. So, um, okay, this is just an infographic. Infographics are very useful sometimes. I was having trouble communicating with people in the office which tower had what program. So, to put this together, you just put that Excel schedule, but immediately you can tell, okay, that's tower one, it goes that many floors. And, you know, so. um, this was a project, some renders. The renders. But you know, we just got really excited by this. When we were like, wow, this is really cool. You know, you can, uh, that, that, that idea that you can be on your balcony and, and, and see, see somebody and wave to them, and the idea that we're creating these little micro habitats rather than one huge tower that no one ever really sees the same person twice, you're ending up with these smaller communities because you've got these mini towers. And the likelihood that you you may bump into the same person in the lift each day who's working in the office. So it's trying to promote these incidental interactions that ultimately make places interesting and make life interesting. So um, some of the renders, uh, show suites. We've actually got a we built this show suite. It's down the Cove Beach uh, in Adelaide. Um, this is <laughs> this is this is funny. Um, we had internally some discussions and said um, maybe we should look at putting some 
pull artwork on the walls of all of these lobbies because they're all going to be colour coded. And then the RDB goes crazy with the colour, they love their colour. Um, so I ended up quickly getting on Photoshop and putting Mr. Happy on there because he's yellow, this one towel is yellow. Sent it through to MVRDB and said, hey, you know, what, do you, what do you think? They're all laughing. <coughs> like, can you just leave that drawing to land? <laughs> so, um, but you know, it's, it's fun. That's why you need to carry on with Photoshop so you can do this sort of stuff and annoy famous architects when you're on. Okay, uh, just very quickly to look through some of the uh, landscape of the ground. You know, this entire area is covered around. It really is covered around. People can wander in all around here. The only private areas are swimming pools. Mountains that we have in the plaza. These are, these, are, these are now all green roofs. All of these low level roofs you can see, we've now got these all green roofs. Um, so it's going to be really lovely when we stand up down. Ignore the, ignore the This is the landscape designer's model. So he didn't look at the, the, the tiles aren't all green like that. They're all worry about that. He's looking at the landscape strategies. Again, this idea of um, the spaces in between the buildings. Don't neglect the spaces in between your buildings. You know, that's the extension of the of your architecture. That's the opportunity to do gorgeous landscape and, and be the spill out area where people occupy and inhabit. And so you have to focus on the negative spaces. So when you're doing your figure ground plan and you draw on your black for your buildings and everything else is white. Don't just think because it's white, you ignore it. That's that's as important as the black is. Uh, these are old now. It's, uh, it's all completely topped out and glazing in and cutting kitchens and uh, the rest of it. So these are quite old. Uh, oh, that's a little bit later because you can see the height. This is Cove Beach, the updated um, beach. Uh, it was part of phase zero. Which is a pretty cool place. Um, and then lastly, um, beyond the Ingalls group, um, so, so this was really interesting. Um, we, we awarded them two plots and it turned out to be just, well, it was a fluke or stroke of genius, but it just, it just transformed everything because if we had just given them one of the plots, well, well look, let me, let me explain the picture says a thousand words. So these were, these were, if you just took the plot plan, that was created from the master plan, it would have just been this, two simple, two simple structures. And of course you could you could give it to an architect and they would do something cool with them. But because we've given them two two plots, we did a whole load of research of you know where have we come from, what have we got now, what we want to avoid, you know, you've got the little courtyard architecture, you've got the uh, you know all these houses and podiums and, and uh, more often than not there's a there's a bit of a issue with the activation of the ground floor plane. Again, courtyard, courtyard traditional architecture. We said to them, look, this is what we don't want. With all due respect to whoever created this, we said, you know, we don't want this because this is just, this is just dead. This is just non-activated facades on the ground floor. You know, we're going to do what we did on the Pixel project. We're going to push the parking below ground, and we're going to have a completely activated ground floor plane. Again. Looks familiar, you know, similar, similar approach, lots and lots of models. These are physical models um, that were laid out um, uh, actually in our cityscape time where we put all of these out on the IDs models. So just, just, you know, going through, well, testing all, I mean, you know, you look at these and say, well, we're not going to do that. Oh, well, we're not saying we're going to do that. Maybe we could do that, but we didn't. But the testing all the different ways that the program could be articulated on the site. And we said, well, we've got this typology plus we know that we need high rise so what does that equal courtyard typology extruded break the edges i love the way the archangels group they always talk about the gift the added thing that to give back to the community so the idea that you break some of this plot out and give back some public realm to the community um, both in the form of courtyard and one building and in the form of you know, farmers markets in the ground floor of the other building. Really, really interesting uh, way to look at it. Um, and then, um, Freddy's, this would be a, this would be a podium deck on this, on this project. This is ground floor of the ground. I say ground floor of the ground, there's actually a transition, and I have already talked about it, the idea of thresholds, this idea of layering of program thresholds between as you move from public into private. 
to take the courtyard, push a couple of vents down, pop the other ones up, create some, some tiers for the, for the residents. You've got a whole series of penthouses all the way down the tower, with beautiful big terraces, and spectacular views out over the bay. So actually that was that, of course, loosely um, that. Um, talking about diagrams and just expressing ideas, just some really simple drawings that um, these guys do. Um, this would be a typical set of standard balconies, connect the balconies, create some shade, and then you've suddenly got these really nice opportunities for people to stand on the balcony and again talking to people above and this idea of connections across across uh, some nice models made. This is a this is a draft program from an early model. Again, program, sorry, it's very blurry drawing, but, but you can see from the colours just the, the mix of program over one floor. So both in plan and in section, you mix the program residential with retail, which typical floor plan, typical uh, residential units, studios, one beds, two beds, reception is uh, a draft render from the uh, farmers market. So that, so that, so that area there, where you can see more detail on the building, is phase one of the district, where you know the, the plan was to to activate all this public ground. That's where Co Beach is now. So that was, that was really good. That's that will be ready sort of next year, and all of these, a lot of these stalks of COVID, but we'll gain gain momentum in due course. Um, so. Um, you know, uh, so in, term, in terms of sort of let's say client side experience, there's. The, re the reason why I wanted to take you on all this stuff sort of leading up to this recent experience on Makers District was because if I just jumped straight into the client side experience, it was kind of like having no context. It's like doing a building with no context. It's, you needed to, wanted to sort of take you through all of the stuff that had led up to being able to work with these guys and help create the vision for, for, for things like Makers District um, and work with these guys intimately on these projects. Um, you know, getting to go to their offices and, um, uh, you know, Copenhagen and Rotterdam and, and you're suddenly working with your heroes. These are people who you've admired and read their books and seen their projects and you're suddenly in a situation where you're working with their teams and helping them to develop these exciting proposals. But, but it's taken a lot of work to get to the point where a developer or a developer would say, hey, would you like to come and work for us as an architect and, and work with these guys? And, and that's why I say, you know, start sort of humbly and, and, and build up. Um, and it's, it's, it's very difficult, it's not impossible just to go straight in and start working on the, the big stuff. You have to kind of manage expectations. Um, um, seven, I haven't got any slides for this. I'm not allowed to share um, uh, anything. A lot of it's slightly confidential. It's just to say the same themes that are playing out at Saudi Entertainment Ventures. We're coming up with new typologies for entertainment in, the, in, in KSA. Um, it's, it's, it's blending, you know, effectively, I mean, I, I don't even say it. It's, it's, it's trying to blend kind of theme parks with retail, food and beverage, but come up with a new archetype and a new typology that ultimately can act as, again, um, a, a potentially a nucleus or a catalyst for development within a district. It can become, a space can become through good public ground design, um, an entertainment centre can become a hub, a community hub where people can gather because it's got a great public ground, um, both internally and externally. And um, so all of these recurring ideas right from University just keep playing out on projects where there's this ambition to create this these mixed use, interesting, you know, dynamic typologies in architecture um, and and blend all these different mixed programs and, and use cases and and create places that people want to repeatedly inhabit and go back to. Um, and as I say, it's kind of the opposite the opposite sort of, of, of doing a simple commercial structure which is only commercial it's how do you build in other programs into uh, into the project um so just, so just to summarize and uh, time is right um, just to summarize um a whole lot of points 
Um, and if I can just skim the surface, really, you can sort of go a whole seminar and bore you on any one of these, I'm sure, at any point. But, but um, so general tips, yeah, traveling, part-time study during work, be humble, start small, you know, build up, um, don't, don't be a cabbage, um, don't, don't just, you know, put yourself forward and put yourself out there and, and get out there and speak with, if, if you're in an office and a director puts you forward to go and present the project to a local authority or a government or somebody, don't just kind of sit there and go, oh, I, don't, I don't want to do that, put yourself forward um, and try and be the person who learns to be articulate about your projects and, and you'll find that that just carries on through. Um, market yourself, yeah, I mean, if you stay in your own company, you've got to market yourself, right? No one's going to do that for you. You've got to build your own brand and, 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 and push. Uh, talked about some about architectural and urban design themes. I don't think I've dug into all of them, but just loosely with the idea of these walkable connected developments, um, sustainability, I, I, I think, sorry, I didn't get into that, but we'll do a whole load of uh, precast materials with um, uh, with, with pixel um, modular off-site trying to clean up what is otherwise quite a dirty uh, construction. Uh, construction is dirty, is what I'm trying to say. We, 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 uh, we try and clean that up off-site construction. Um, mixed use, I thought about that, public realm, human scale, just be sensitive to that, most basic measures, communities, trying to promote thriving communities, create diversity and design for um, and then the client side experience, uh, yeah, so what I didn't touch on just to finish was, of course, I'm talking really from the side of design management, um, working for a client because I'm an architect. Of course, there's people in the office who are absolutely focused on development, the development side of, of, of being in development, which is you know, when you start to get into net present values and all of this stuff, you know, it's the profits and the loss. And I mean, this is a totally different thing. It's obviously all very much interlinked in the office. Um, it's, it's, it's all one and the same, but I'm just talking about in terms of the emphasis. Um, I'm now trying to sort of um, develop my development skills by doing additional courses. You could just go and do a, a real estate, a master's in real estate development. But, you know, in fact, if you realise that that's the kind of the metric side of things, what you you're actually ambitious about. Um, but to get into real hardcore design management, you typically need sort of 10 to 15 years of experience on the consultant side before the development the developer would say, "Come and work for us and, and, and help us." Um, uh, yeah, and you need to develop communication skills. It goes without saying you, you're, you're going to be working with huge teams of contractors and consultants and sitting in a room and talking with them. You've got to try and motivate and inspire people in what are really challenging situations sometimes. And quite frankly, it sometimes feels like there's going to be a fight breakout in these rooms. The tensions are high, you know, the stakes are high, and you have to try and be the voice of reason sometimes in these, in these situations. Um, and, and look, you get to write a brief and set the vision, and you can be instrumental in helping with steer design, which is a lot of fun and work with the hero. So it's definitely a very interesting side of the fence to be on, this dark side. Um, but um, a bit you need, you know, you need to be humble and start and build up to, up to that. So um, I think that'll be it. So I'll talk <laughs> long. Thank you. Uh, just following up on that, um, we are we're moving into the school uh, 26 in November, uh, the summit in Glasgow about yes. uh, uh, sustainable goals and all coming up. Yes. So from the developers, I have a follow up question for uh, yes. from the developer end, what is being pushed on, on that side in terms of sustainability and promoting and pushing these architects and designers yeah. Uh, yeah. to come over and, and yeah, it's a really good question actually because um, we were having a uh, meeting with the engineering company that's appointed on the projects in Saudi about this recently. We were discussing all of the different uh, codes that we could look at, for example, whether it be LEED or ICU Dharma or the local um, codes that were starting to come up in, in KSA. Um, and we're saying which ones are the most relevant. And look, in that meeting, we said, actually just stopped at one point and said, what 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 can we do more than just following SDR or lead? You know, you have your passive measures and it seems like this box ticking exercise, but you know, we it, it we know it's code red, right? It's code red on earth at the moment. And we said this is a huge issue. We don't just want to be another lead 
awarded project, like what else can we do? Well, we posed a question to them and said, you need to really start thinking outside of the box and come up with something. What, what, what do we have to do? We have to build a, a carbon capture plan or something. What, what do we do as a developer? How can we really push the boat out? Um, because there's, there's lots of things that you can do and you can follow these, you can follow these codes and, and you can get your faster and rating and everything. Um, but there's the, there's the bigger picture again going back to the, the, the master plan, the sustainable master plan, trying to keep trying to keep people within this live work play environment where you're not promoting you know commuting and, and all, all, all of these things. Um, but then there's also um, there's the passive passive measures, passive architectural measures measures. Um, I was just gonna say something else, sorry, I lost my train of thought, it's an important point. Um, It'll come to me in a minute. But the point the point was we were we were trying to we were trying to see if there's anything that we could do that was completely outside of the box as a developer to to go beyond the norm to go beyond the norm we do everything we possibly can for the development but at the end of the day you have to first accept we're going to develop and we're going to construct which is a which is a bad bad thing to do for the environment it's a hugely intense carbon intensive process once you've accepted that you have to say what can we do to try and give back? Um, and um, you know, for example, KSA is committed to uh, net zero by 2030. Um, and you know, how then does that project then plug into that wider ambition, whereby ultimately we're giving back to the grid and we're, we're, you know, we're not putting any more carbon. So, so your question is actually a question that I, I put back beyond all of my knowledge with sustainable development and you know, trying to clean up construction precast. Can use precast elements off site, modular design, and try and clean up what's otherwise a very dirty process. Beyond all of that knowledge, what can we do to really think outside the box and other than not develop <laughs> full stop? Um, so, so, yeah, it's a good question, it's a very relevant question. We've been discussing the same, the same thing um, how do we fast track towards carbon zero? Yeah. Just, can you just say that one? Just, just say one more time, something I missed the... Say a bit louder. Yeah, sorry. Do you want to... Yes, well, this way, okay, okay. Um, so my question is, because you said that the proposal that got picked up by the Environment Commission was quite ambitious, and that it was quite a big step forward, but it wasn't really quite the right direction. Correct, yes, yes, correct. Uh, interaction was very less than. Yes, correct. Coming to the... Since site analysis plays a very big role, in spatial planning and how you build and design a project yes. functions as well. Would you say that the completed project in the Pikmin project has exceeded your expectations in terms of the outcome? Um, or have they also made you think in a different direction? Um, I think it's uh, I think it would be lying to say that with projects you don't look look back and think you would have done something different. Um, you know, nothing is nothing bulletproof. Um, and you know you learn during you learn during that sort of process. I mean, for example, the the Pixel project, the NVRDB project. Um, there are sacrifices that are made when you're having that level of articulation on a tower, and it starts to impact on efficiency. You know, and efficiency is a huge thing for a developer when you look at the, the sellable area versus what you're actually building. So, so. There's always lessons to be learned on every project. You know, did you overdo the articulation? Should you have six towers instead of seven? You know, all of these questions. Site analysis will will only go so far um, with this. Um, you you have to you, you definitely have to get. Um, there's a lot of things that have to fall into place before you push the button on a developer. You have to have certain metrics that you need to you need to reach as as, as from the development side in terms of efficiency, but you always look back and say, could we have done it better, of course. Um, um, what, what was I saying? Yeah, yeah site, site analysis can, can only go so far, and if you're not careful, you'll just get caught up in an endless loop. There's many, many projects that never really get out of the gates because you just keep overthinking and overworking. You have to get, at some point, you have to move the ball forward and 
translate that site analysis into some built form and then start working up and developing that scheme. And it's it's not to say you can't go back. You can't go, you know, you, you, you could get into, you know, many projects get into concept design and then you look at them and say, actually, that doesn't, that doesn't work. It doesn't work for us. The outcome of that doesn't work. We need to go back half a stage and re rethink. So, um, yeah, I think um, your, your, your site analysis is critical to getting the best outcome, and ideally, you ideally you um, you iron out all of these things at a very very early stage. But but ultimately, you do have to keep the ball more good ball moving forward. And some of the challenges in development on fast track projects are that. The demands to move the ball forward at pace. Sometimes you get to the point where you've done all this work and you say, "Whoa, hang on, <laughs> we should have gone back and reviewed that earlier and, and put that through the through the washer again." So it's so yeah. Ch ch I think I think when you've got time, you you you, you try and get it perfect, but but you you've got to you've got to move the ball forward. Don't 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 ever think it's the point that you never progress. <laughs> into the next stage. Um, you can also go back and do reworks and tweaks. But the, fun the fundamentals have to be there though. The fundamentals have to be there. If you get to the end of concept design or you work in scheme design and you realise the building's in the wrong place on the site because you didn't realise there was a busy road and you put the public in, okay, then that's that's a failing of the site analysis. That's it's extremely important to get the fundamentals right. But I'm talking about tweaks so you can do along the way. Uh, that's the question, sorry. Um, actually, so what I was leaning towards asking is project that you put in progress. Yes, yes. Upon completion, would you say they're exceeding your expectations of the response to what you've uh, Yeah, sure. I mean, the ones with um, uh, MVR and the MVR group, for sure. I mean, you know, the example was there of the two plots that we gave to big, um, where our expectation was for these two very separate sort of buildings, but the fact the way that they were able to connect them across this public uh, boulevard through and connect this kind of loop Process, yeah, that, that, that exceeded all expectations, way beyond anything that I would have come up with. Uh, you know, my creativity it, it exceeded w way, way, way beyond that. Um, and and same with MVRDB with with the towers around the plaza. You know, that's not what we had on the original master plan. That's not what we were shown. We were shown some other sort of G plus six building. So so yeah, they they far exceeded. And that's the beauty of working with extremely creative uh, architects. You, know, you learn a hell of a lot from from working with these guys. And, and seeing the process that they go through to get to that point is extremely exciting. So, no, hats off to these guys. It's uh, it's great. And all you can do is help sort of steer and manage, and you know that's yeah. You know. Can I ask? Yes. Yeah. Uh, the cost is usually the litmus test, you know. Yes. <laughs> so, at what stage was this test applied? Uh, if it was at the concept stage, or uh, you had to kind of uh, uh, re rewrite the rules to let it through? Uh, no, I mean, you, you go through um, uh, all different stage gates. We can specifically for two projects. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You go, you go through different stage gates on the development side. You have an, 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 out, an outline cost plan done right at the concept stage, and then that develops into a more detailed cost plan and schematic stage. So it ran through in the concept? It runs all the way through. And then actually, what we ended up doing on one of those projects, because then there were budget cuts. After we'd had an approved budget and then also the budget cuts, what we ended up doing was it's a really interesting process to go through, we ended up doing on a number of projects, is to um, to bring in a contractor, bring in a contractor during the scheme design stage and actually have the contractor sit and work with you through some of the documentation. So you end up getting a contractor's inputs on the details, and that saves millions, absolutely millions and millions, um, because Rather than, rather than, you know, I'm an architect, right? But with the best will in the world, architects will put together a tender set of documentation, thinking that that's the best, the best and most cost-effective solution. Um, it, of, it often isn't, and engineers will, you know, sometimes over-engineer things. And, and then if you tender a set of documents, full detailed construction documentation, and then the budget comes back and it's way, way over, well, you've got a hell of a lot of rework to then do. Um, so, um, uh, and the contractor will have to typically sort of take that on and you accept it. If you can bring the contractor in early and get that early input in the process, it's invaluable because they can work with the architects and the engineering teams and they can say, you don't need that much reinforcement bar, uh, you know, we've done it on 
this project and say, let's really, and, and you end up with a shopping list on Excel of all potential value engineering. And if you do it at that early stage, it's genuine value engineering in the process. It's not cost cutting. It's but value. in both the cases, were the architects able to convince the client on the cost well, at, we, the concept, at the concept stage? We, were, we, we, had, we, had, we had a budget, and then you had to work. The, 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 the design had to be worked to Meet that the budget. budget. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Take one last. Oh, we'll take two last questions, then we'll end because we're already over time. Oh, okay, yeah. So my question was, uh, since you work, work with big, yes. Yes. How was it working with big, and how much do you think they actually give attention to the concept of sustainability? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Just to let you know, he's doing a dissertation on on bigger. Oh right, okay, okay. Um, they're great to work with. Like no, no, no doubt, really, really cool team of guys and girls. Um, yeah. uh, so that's the first question. I mean, no, no doubts there. Um, I would say um, they were building at that time, starting to build their regional uh, portfolio, so they're having you can get projects in this region. Um, there were some things where you know we had lots of discussions with them about, for example, um, glazing and curtain wall and. We had the engineers looking at you know, this, this kind of looping balcony that was coming down um, to ensure that we were getting the right shade on glazing because we wanted to take some concepts from their projects as they have executed them so well in Europe. You know, we're going to visit their projects in Copenhagen. It's all about community and seeing people. Um, uh, you know, it's not about having tinted windows, it's about having glass where you can see your neighbours and wait for the neighbours. It's very extreme in Europe. To bring that concept here is, is, is a challenge, so we have to find this fine balance. It's a challenge not just because of privacy, because here is slightly different culturally, but it's a, it's an issue in terms of if we're putting that much curtain walling and glazing, how do we meet the U values? So ultimately, it's finding it's finding that balance. Yes, I mean they're of course absolutely attentive to the the requirements that we had. Again, passive measures of the courtyard, creating a act, um, passive shading to the courtyard, and shading to the to the um, to the, um, to the, glaze, the glazed walls, and then ultimately the specific comes down to the specification of the glass. If you want glass, you need to put in a high spec glass that's going to meet your thermal uh, thermal requirements. So, but <coughs> to answer your question, yeah, great to work with and very much on board with trying to ensure that we hit the targets for STDAM STDAM requirements and that. Yeah, very very proactive, very proactive team. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.